Good evening and welcome to What Not Podcast. I'm Mike Z. Well, that went live faster than I thought. This is Chris. <laughs> and of course, Chris uh, taking on his cheer wine addiction to a whole new level during our show. That's what happens. Yes. So uh, today we are going to talk a little bit about dust collection. Chris has uh, recently acquired a new tool for the shop and is going to be filming everything as far as the unboxing and the revealing, but also his current setup that he's using now, how he kind of configured it. He has a video on his YouTube channel for that, and then how he's going to be incorporating this new tool. Yeah, you know, like a lot of other people, I started out with just a shop vac and then a one dust collector hooked up and you know constantly changing from tool to tool and boy that gets old fast um and you realize the benefit of having it so you you know start running lines so i ran initially i ran you know plastic four inch dust pipe then realized there was a lot of problems so then i upgraded from that to pvc and saw a lot better performance uh, but, you know, most dust collectors are a little limited anyway. So especially if it's a bag style. Uh, so wound up getting a super dust deputy set up, um, which created more of a cyclone system. And I did have a, one of those trash can lid things. And they did. They worked really well. I mean, I had that for a long time. But then I got to CNC and I really needed to upgrade my setup. So that's kind of how the journey began. So because of the CNC and its requirement, Decided to go ahead and upgrade the dust collector, or what did you get? Well, that was the reason why I'd gotten that uh, super dust deputy, and it, because I was making so many chips and doing some MDF, and I was emptying that plastic bag on the dust collector almost weekly. And you know, I've, I've ran a planer for years, and man, the CNC is just insane, especially with the fine dust coming off of MDF, mm-hmm. and it it just it was clogging the filter bag it was clogging you know loading up the the plastic bag so that's when i upgraded to that went to the barrel and the minute i did that i i probably emptied that barrel that i've got hooked up i don't know since i did it last summer probably i don't know 15 times but i have yet to empty out the plastic bag okay um and i bet i could bring a a gallon can over here and maybe not even fill halfway up the gallon can. So with the dust that's in there, and that's from nine months, I guess, something like that. Yeah, that's really good. So then that's uh, Oneida? Yeah, the Oneida Super Dust Deputy. And, um, you know, I, I, and I've had that for a while, and I've been running it, and it's working fine. But what I did, which is a little bit unique, um, again, the CNC, it, it, it just, you want to get as much of that as you can. And the way I have the pipe ran, there was there just wasn't a good way for me to get it over to my CNC without creating several more bends and drops. And so I was just simply running a hose across the floor to the pipe and then getting it that way. And I was getting decent. But then I bought one of those little small jet. They were was like one of the last ones that was available. They don't make it anymore. It's like looks like a little snail with a long tail kind of the ones you can hang on the wall if you want to but i got one of those and i thought you know what i could buy that and use that as a booster for the cnc so i mounted it under the cnc ran instead of a a cloth bag coming out of it which is normally the outlet port of the cnc actually mounted a rubber boot and made it converted it into a connection system where it would connect into my quick fit hose for the dust collection so it acts like a booster and i ran a test i think i got uh an additional 200 CFM, something like that, by using that as a booster compared to just using the uh, the old one and a half Rikon that I had by itself. So it was worth the investment because it certainly boosted and benefited that. So now, how did you find out you got an additional 200 CFM out of that? Well, I bought a a tool called an enemometer, enemometer. It's designed to measure wind flow. And you can get these fairly inexpensive, you know, Amazon and places like that. Um, I've also, whenever I used to do wide belt testing, we had a, a really higher end one that was Bluetooth and, and did a lot of other things. But um, 
So I went with that. I, I can't remember what I paid for it. It might have been 50, 60 bucks or whatever. It's but I deal. knew that, that that I was going to be upgrading my CNC and my dust collection and all these other things. And I wanted to get good, true readings before I did it because I've been in a hunt for a cyclone now for, I don't know, probably since October. Been saving up for it and I've been doing research. And I'm one of these people that, you know, I'll research it for three months before I buy it sometimes longer, but ended up uh, researching some stuff and I reached out to a few companies. I'm a huge fan of Rikon, Um and obviously they don't have a cyclone. So I, you know, out of just curiosity, I, you know, cause all these companies nowadays are doing a lot of R and D and getting some things together. So I'd reached out to them um, cause I post a lot about my other tools that I've got from there and um, ended up uh, somehow getting a hold of some higher ups and uh, said, yeah, it just so happens. We're in the middle of uh, R and D on a on a cyclone, so so like, okay, well keep me keep me informed. And I'm not quite ready, but next thing I know, it's you know March, and I started this hunt in like October, November, and um, well, it, it's ready. So they offered to let me have one to test to uh, go along with my other blue and gray tools in the shop. <laughs> And uh, so it's so new that the one behind the curtain there is, uh, I think it, it's the only one right now out in the country that's actually assembled and being tested. Um, out in the wild. Time. Yeah, the rest of them are still, you know, wherever they do their R&D at. So uh, pretty pretty cool, pretty stoked about that. I mean, I've never been the first for anything, uh, you know, other than the first one, at the first one at the buffet. I'm usually pretty, pretty front of the line on that. But – you know, so it worked out really, really well, and uh, so I, I'm excited about it. And last night I brought it home, and uh, I used that tool to keep me cool on the beach. Well, you could, but you'd have to run a really long drop cord. But I think he was talking about your uh, oh, the anemometer. Yeah, that, well, it okay. would require somebody to. So it's unlikely you'd want that. So bring a stick of gum or require them to, to pop a mint or something. So anyway, I, it's kind of where it started and it, I'm just really excited because uh, the folks at Rikon, you know, their, their, they, their machinery is just really good for the money. Very good price point, good quality and fantastic customer service. Yeah. You know, in today's age, man, all these other companies are, are starting to really lose that part of the business and customer service is where it's at. So, yeah. I mean, you can make a mediocre tool, but if you got fantastic customer service, it's going to keep people coming back. Yep. And I think most of their stuff's all five years. And, and, and their the quality's good. The motors are good. The, the build is good. I mean, it's, you know, I uh, this thing was so new when I got it home the other night and you know, I got it unpackaged last night and was starting to put it together. I realized uh, um, one crucial thing, and I know I'm a guy. And most men are like owner's manual, ha ha ha. Not not this one, you know. I, I put together a Barbie Jeep from one of my daughters when they were young, and it was a six-hour build. And I made the mistake of not using the owner's manual and snapped the part together. And after that, you you wasn't designed to come back apart, but I had to get it back apart because it was another crucial component that had to go in beforehand. Mm -hmm. So I'm an owner's manual guy. I may not read it in depth, but I will peruse it just to make sure I kind of have an idea of what's happening. And, well, there's no owner's manual. So thankfully I've assembled enough machines that um, I went through it slowly and methodically and made a few boo-boos, but uh, was able to recover and get what's behind the curtain there. So, so uh, how many parts were left over when you first put it together? Last night I had two parts left over. It was a giant okay. ring, a washer, and one bolt with a flat washer and a um, lock washer. And it was the only bolt like it. There was no other bolt, you know, that same way. Hmm. And so I was like, hmm. And I'd taken a few photos. I was going to reach out to the folks at Rikon and say, hey, you know, what's this little part? Is this like just extra in case I need it? Hmm. Uh, and by the before they emailed it back, I was looking at my own photographs and I, I realized exactly what it was. And then talking with one of the guys uh, at the Clean Sport Woodworking Shop store, he assembled a lot of those cyclones. He goes, that looks like one of those uh, washers that you use to hold the impeller on. I'm like, oh. That's what it is. So, needless to say, I took the motor all back off and got that on first thing the night when I got home. So, so uh, and and I take it you've done some testing on this to kind of get a reading of what 
your, I mean, cause if there's no owner's manual, you have no specs. Right. Well, and they're still in the process of, of specking it out and kind of making sure all the parts are right. And as a matter of fact, the, the prototype that I've got here, they knew that on one of the original samples that was sent over for approval, that the center panel that it it's uh, right in the middle and it runs vertically right between the, the front of the unit and the back. It's really more for stability, I guess, in sound, but uh, they knew that panel was made just a little bit short from what it needed to be. And so I had to use a clamp to clamp the sides together enough where I could get that part tightened in. Uh, but it's not going to hurt the stability of it or the functionality of it. It just, you know, but they know that, and I mentioned that, and they, they've already uh, got that part fixed for the production side of things. But uh, other than that, man, it, it came in a real heavy crate. Everything was was packaged well. Matter of fact, once I launched the video, you'll see I spent about 20 minutes trying to figure out how to get the motor out of it. And then I realized that uh, there was a band that held the upper and lower part together. Once I disassembled that, the whole thing came right out. But if I had an owner's manual, it would have told me. <laughs> So this is kind of the, uh, <clears throat> this is what happens when you're part of the R&D process is that sometimes you don't get an owner's manual mm -hmm. and sometimes you kind of have to put things together based on your previous knowledge of engineering specs. Yeah. And thankfully, I mean, there wasn't a lot of, of parts to assemble. Um, I mean, you had a bunch of bolts, but literally all of them, but the three that went into the, um, the, the, four inch by three union that mounts on the front. Obviously those were different than the others. The, and then there was a, the bolt that went into the, the impeller housing. And I think there was one other bolt that was a little, obviously clearly different than the rest. Um, but other than that, I mean, it was pretty much just bolts and huh. uh, an owner's manual would have given me good insight into the, the proper layout. And once we uncover it, you'll see what I mean. There, there's a, one side has handles so you can roll it and pull it out. Well, I made a mistake and put those vertical uprights facing backwards and you wouldn't know it unless you knew there were handles coming. So needless to say, that's in my video too. When I mess up, I leave it in my videos that I launch because I want people to see, you know, I'm just like everybody else. I make mistakes, you know, sometimes multiple mistakes, but uh, hey, at least you get it right eventually. Yeah. But I worked hard tonight and got, got everything wired up and fixed and, <laughs> put my animal meter uh, to it because I want to get some initial specs just so that when we uncover it, you'll be able to, you know, I'll be able to at least share with you some of the data that was initially taken from it. Cause um, you know, they're right now still trying to figure out what they're going to, what, what range they're going to list it in. I mean, a lot of these, these dust collection manufacturers, they, yeah, we make 3000 CFM, but when you actually hook a pipe to it and you measure it, it's more like, you know, 2000. So um, a lot of them like to shoot for the moon, but they, they're really, you know, really just not there, not even close. And, you know, we all, if you're a woodworker, you know, you know, like that little, uh, what was that little table saw years ago? It was really like a job site hobby saw five horsepower when there's no way you were going to put a five horsepower motor in that little, you know, 50 I remember pound saw. I remember the Bosch 4400 claimed four horsepower out of a 110. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was. And, you know, other manufacturers do it too, you know, mm -hmm. routers and, and, and whatnot. Everybody likes to, you know, more horsepower, more this, more that. And if you've been woodworking at all, you know, you can't use those numbers as facts. You just kind of have to go off your gut and kind of know what to expect off of a machine. You know, and then that, you got companies like uh, Festool mm -hmm. that refuse to get into the horsepower game. They yep. just tell you how many watts. And if you are if you're too lazy to figure out what the wattage means and what that translates into, then that's on you. They don't want you to buy their tool anyway. And you don't deserve to buy their tool. So So let's just give away the secret. It's around it's I think it's seven forty six, but around seven fifty is a horsepower. And so like if you look at their um twenty two hundred router, you know, that's like three horsepower. If you look at their fourteen hundred router, two horsepower, like that's the way they do it. Yeah. So you got to be cautious, you know, if, especially when we're, when we're talking about dust collection. I mean, everybody's got a claim on the CFM and they, they you know, shoot to high numbers. So, yeah, that would be my one good takeaway is, as far as advice goes is don't just trust the numbers. Um, I know when they 
initially, when Rikon initially uh, sent me sort of a spec sheet on this thing, um, they were claiming 2,600 CFM, but more nominally, it was supposed to be around the 23, 24 range. And I did an initial spec right out of the 8-inch port that's on the front, and I got 220, 21.25 tonight. So I figure that's, that's – they're pretty close to that. I mean, if they're within a couple hundred on when you're getting to the CFM, that's – That's good. You know, yeah. I mean, because any your, – your your humidity can make that change. Your your elevation can make that change. There's so many factors that go into these numbers. I mean, it, yeah. if you can get close to that, you're – so – so would you say that um no nah, I was going to say it but I won't say it. Well, usually they're blowing smoke, but in this case since it's dust collection So anyways, yeah. I regress. Yeah. Yeah. You so since um those who are joining us live get to see this dust collector in the wild for the first time ever anywhere, which is yep. pretty cool. And we didn't expect to do this. So this is really one of those things where they just said, Hey, would you mind? And you're like, uh, sure. Thus yeah. Here we are. Yeah. I was going to, you know, obviously promote it on my own channel, but we, we were just thinking, man, this is a, it's a good platform to launch a, a brand new tool never before seen in the United States. I mean, yep. what else are you going to see something like that other than the whatnot podcast, right? That's right. <laughs> whatnot podcast bringing you machinery first. Sometimes, yeah. Once in a while, from time to time. But no, I'm pretty excited about it. it it's uh, it's got a one micron filter bag, a filter on the back. Um, it does come with a bag uh, to you know at the bottom of that. It's got a removable catch barrel that's on wheels. So if you move the unit, the barrel comes with it. Um, the barrel does have a cage that sits inside the plastic bag. So that way, you know, it doesn't get sucked up in. I think at this point, most of these dust manufacturers, these dust collection manufacturers have realized if you're going to put a bag in a barrel, you better put something to keep it from being sucked up into the unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so they, they does come with a, with a sharp cage is what I'm calling it. Um, and that, that sits in there. And so, um, you know, built pretty well. And I mean, for a prototype, there was one little blemish on the front of the barrel that, um, you know, I don't think it was from shipping because the way that thing was packaged, it was, package really well but again this is a prototype so I'm, I'm, i wasn't expecting you know rikon with blue colors and all that it's it's it looks like a machine that's they're ready to go to production with so very cool um, yeah no, which i like because i like that blue color it's a nice color in my shop so it is a nice color um with the uh r d part of this is there a requirement on your part to be able to say hey you know this or you know, th like that panel was kind of thinner than maybe what you thought or you saw maybe as a possible issue. Is that, is that a requirement from them or is that something that you're just kind of throwing out there? No. I mean, you know, in our general conversation, you know, initially when I asked, these, you know, and, and they were looking to bring one in, I, I was kind of just playing around sort of and was like, hey, you know, if you need somebody to test one, hey, I'm your guy. Let me know. And turned out. I guess they had looked at my channel and been seeing some of the content and they said, yeah, we want you to test it. So um, the only requirement is to give them true feedback and, um, you know, um, talk about it, which, you know, obviously I'm going to, cause it's, it's about to be an integral part of my shop mm -hmm. um, with every tool that gets turned on. So, it's well, that, used. so, um, you know, and, and it's going to be in a lot of videos upcoming because I'm going to be, a really weird place to pause so uh if you're just now joining us for our live presentation chris has received a new r d spec what yep hey there you are there we go so uh in the midst of your pause there what were you saying um well, just that uh, because I'm getting ready to upgrade all my, my dust collection pipe from the 4-inch PVC to 8-inch and 6-inch uh, PVC and some other fittings, there'll be quite a bit of content coming down the line when I go through that process. And, of course, I'll have the video on the assembly part. Um, then once I get it all set up, I'll have a, a review on the, on the tool 
and do readings. Obviously, I've already taken readings for all my tools now. And since I'm waiting another five weeks on a couple of parts to come in that I'm going to need before I convert everything to 8-inch, I'm going to remove my old system, which, by the way, I'm selling right now. So the uh, uh, I'm going to put it where my old system was and use the existing 4-inch lines. And my game plan with that is it's going to give me a true test of the difference between this model versus the one and a half uh, Rikon that I had in there um, with the Super Dust Deputy. Because essentially what I did with the, the one I have now is I got rid of everything. I kept the squirrel cage and kept the, the ring uh, that holds the bag and the filter. So what I ended up doing was I built a rack above the super dust deputy barrel and their their cyclone setup mm -hmm. and turned that unit completely on its side and then instead of like a traditional dust collector that's mounted on a cart that has a hose that goes up to that barrel ring it's all connected into one solid unit um and that helped improve you know and minimize some of my air loss and stuff but so i'm going to get rid of all of that and upgrade and put that in its place and just kind of give me a true comparison between the old system and the new system so you're taking all this data down you got it all scientifically laid out and this is basically more for just yourself than it is for any of the r d stuff this is just for you and of well, course it's your content yeah, I mean, and, and it's important. I mean, I, I'm one of these that if I'm going to do something, if I only gained 100 CFM, then I wasted a ton of money. Um, mm -hmm. So the, it's more for my own knowledge. So I know what I'm yielding at all my machines now um, with, the, with the upgrade. But two, I'm hoping to take that data because I'll have the original machine data. I'll have the new machine data running off the exact same lines. And then I'll have the new machine data running off all of the new lines. So I'll have true data from all of those perspectives. And I'm hoping I can be able to you know, translate that into some content that will, if nothing else, be helpful to other people who are considering, should I upgrade to a cyclone or should I just keep plugging my dust collector in one tool at a time? Because yeah, there I mean, has to be value in that. Well, and the journey you've taken is taking a smaller one horsepower squirrel cage type dust collector, mm -hmm. adding the super dust deputy to it to transform it into a cyclone, and then now actually going to a, a standalone cyclone unit. I think all of that and that journey itself will kind of answer a lot of questions that people may have. Hey, should I do this? Should I do that? So it's a nice journey to to be able to watch on your YouTube channel. Well, and considering what it started with, you know, three years ago, it's it's it come a long way. So. Absolutely. So, would you say that uh, the dust collector, if one was to have one in the shop, is probably the most used tool? It's it's probably the most used tool, but it's the most underrated in regards to what you'd think of when you're thinking about setting up a shop. Yeah. Um, but I've been doing woodworking a long time, and you know, a lot of times you, 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 you tend to sacrifice one safety product for another. What I mean by that is if you're cutting something, you either going to protect your eyes or you're going to protect your, your lungs. Because a lot of times if you're trying to protect your lungs, it's going to fog up glasses. So it's, it's kind of a, it's a lot of times, unless you're doing it right, you, you got a lot of trade-offs. And for years I sacrificed my lungs for the sake of my eyes. So I, I figured if I'm in my own shop, I need to fix that and I need to be, you know, me thinking about my future because I'm investing in all of this equipment for my future, for my retirement. I know I don't look that old, but I learned a long time ago, buying cheap, you're going to get cheap. So yep. I'm just investing for my future and uh, for my side business. So. Yeah. And I kind of looked at, uh, you know, whenever you tell someone you work at a woodworking shop, like, you know, the candy store, Everyone's kind of like, oh, man, it must really stink. It's like only for about the first month because you don't get a paycheck. You want to spend it all. But at the same time, when you really start to look at it, you can start to plan out your future shop. If you are there long enough, you can really kind of build your retirement plan without having to you know, do it all at the end, if you will. Well, and, and because we work there and we both manage the store and talk to the customers and sold a lot of the equipment, we get to kind of really know what what tools or in machines how they're built yeah. because we assemble a lot of that crap 
Yep. And, and we know from customer feedback, you know, what that looks like. So we get a lot of real life reviews on products mm-hmm. versus trusting something on a website that has a three star, four star and some random obscure, you know, review that's left by somebody. So. And usually the person who comes in and has an issue or doesn't like something about it, you don't find out right away. They're not going to be angry and walk in and just come to the counter, slam their hand down and say, yeah, I want to complain about this. Mm -hmm. There's one, maybe in a thousand that do that. But the typical customer, you're talking to them, you know, oh man, you know, that's right. You got that dust collector a little while back. What did you think about it? Then you open up that door. Then that's when they tell you the true feedback. So I find that you get true feedback by actually communicating with people rather than looking at reviews. But I am 100% with you that I am one of those guys that will review something to death mm-hmm. before I finally pull the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we're both a, a lot alike in regard, those regards. So mm-hmm. I, tr- I trust your opinion quite a bit when it comes to electronic stuff. Cameras, oh, you're totally audio, wrong by that. All that. So. <clears throat> Oh man, the megahertz on this is uh, seventeen point three four gigahertz to the gnome audio. Blah 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 blah. And I'm just saying, like, dude, does it work? Is it worth the money? <laughs> yeah, it's great. Okay, that's all I need to know. That's exactly what it is too. So I'll be like, oh man, you got to get this because of this, this, and this feature. And you're like, yeah, but how long does the battery last? Yeah. Well, okay, well, yeah, that's pretty good. Do they offer accessories for it? Yeah. Can someone do it for me? Yeah. So anyway, it's been a fun fun couple of days getting this thing together so so we're going to show it off i mean it's only 30 sure. minutes to do it yeah matter of fact, we can. let me turn some lights on unmute my little box here and that camera is going to have it all on there in three two one well, that was uneventful. <laughs> well, that was nice. I can't you hear know. a thing you're saying, but good. So here's the three-way um, by four port. Uh, you will note that I did wrap some tape on this. Uh, there was quite a gap here, so I wanted to go ahead and get this sealed. Other than that. Um, it's got quick release on the barrel. Everything goes right back in place real quickly. Locks locks down. It's got a two and a half horsepower motor, and which is nice. I can pop this off, and it's got a true eight inch inlet, so that's going to be handy. The on off switch is over here on this side, um, and these are the handles that originally I put on incorrectly. So you can see everything kind of moves around. These front two wheels are omnidirectional. The back two are fixed. So it kind of creates a scenario like that. But quite a cool little setup. Very impressed for their first time out with a Cyclone. So Here's looking at you, kid. But... Uh, hang on just a second. Let's see if I can't spin it around if there's enough room. There's not enough room. That voids the warranty. Ah. Uh. So there you go. What do you think? Wow. All yeah, I can that, was loud, is I'm sure. that was, yeah, that was wonderful noise. Yeah. You should get a clip of that and we'll just play that in the background as music. We'll record that later as like an intro or something. Yeah, there you go. So anyway, that is the uh, Rikon, the model number 60 2500, which is currently not on their website. It is not on their website. It is not available. Um, currently, they have very limited information on it, i.e. owner's manual. Um, they do have a spec sheet say. that they can send. Um, but for the most part, they don't know when this is going to go into production. They want to do some more testing on that. So 
I'm trying to take advantage of me being the only one in the United States that owns one um, and do some quick feedback on it. So this is uh, kind of timely, and that's the reason why I'm not going to wait on my uh, parts to come in in five weeks uh, to outfit it. That's why I'm going to go outfit it immediately. That makes um, sense. Get started on it. Yeah, because who knows what they might decide to do in you know six weeks. They may say, well, we want someone else to do it. Well, I don't want that. I want to do it. So I'm going to take advantage of my opportunity. So, so let me ask you this. Did you save the box? It's a crate. Did you save the crate? I'm not sending it back. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. There was a there was an old lathe that Rycon made that came in a really nice box, and I actually took all the sides off, and that's my spray calls for the sawhorses. Hmm. To this day, it's like eight years later. Um, I'll go grab the other camera and I'll show you my current system so you can see how that setup looks. So hang on just a second. All right. So one of the things I noticed about that right away is that the crank handle is on the bottom by the bag, which is different. And then I do like the lock mechanisms on how you release the drum. That's a lot quicker than some of the others that are on the market. Can you so that was kind of a different feature. Michael? See, I've got the Super Dust Deputy Barrel. right there i've got a uh, sort of a homemade lift handle to be able to get in there and change that that goes straight up through the super dust deputy system right into what used to, what is the squirrel cage formerly of a 60-150 rack on turned on its side i've got it mounted to a platform then that goes straight into the barrel ring and down into the bag and you can see again there's hardly any dust in there and that's after like nine months. So normally I have that mounted up, but I have to take it down when I raise my door. But um, essentially that is uh, the setup that I currently have, which has served me very well. Now, typically I run a line over here and you can see the jet underneath the CNC and the cheer ones. Um, but that's my booster. I call that my booster dust collector. So, anyway, get this set back up here. Make sure we're spotting the rack on. I'm going to take a bet that that's a Bessie clamp right up front. <laughs> so uh two of the things that i noticed right off the bat is that the crank handle for getting rid of you know to move the pleats is down by the bag which is kind of unusual usually they're up on top mm -hmm. now I, the it's not shown but the pleats do go all the way up from that handle so when you spin that they go from about two inches up here all the way up to the top Okay. Uh, it's, it's likely that I'm not going to be using this in a lot of my research. And uh, let me mute that other mic. In a lot of my research, what I found was these things that beat the inside of the pleat to clean them off. They decrease the overall life of the filter uh -huh. because it's that hard plastic banging on the inside of those, those pleats. So in my research, what I found is you're almost better off not using those pleat beaters for whatever term they they're called, but, uh, pleat beater just, works. I like that. We'll go with it. Disassembling that and just blowing out the filter with a, you know, leaf blower or something. So it's unlikely I'll use that, but I will use the other part. Now I wish I wouldn't, didn't have that turned the other way. Um, because, the way this is designed that eight inch slash four by three union comes straight out the front. 
Now there are bolt holes where that part is mounted. And my initial thinking is I'm going to take those bolts off and rotate that one hole and re-bolt it. Because where this is going to go in my corner, that should get me about a, th a 30 or 45 degree turn, which will make my life a lot easier when I go to run that 8-inch pipe. Tell you what, do me a huge favor. Go ahead and slowly turn that dust collector. I, I want to see the handles more than anything of how that connects up close. And please, for everyone at home, you can mute it. What you looking for? The quick levers for the barrel. Yeah. Yeah. So the barrel's always on the ground being, so that pushes it down rather than like a Laguna grabs a hold of it. You have that big lever. You have to lift it up and it picks it up off the ground. So then, of course, the weight of the barrel eventually starts to pull that down. I always thought that was kind of a design feature that I wasn't a, excited and this is adjustable. So there's a, a lock nut on the bottom and a lock nut on top. So if you need to put exert more pressure downward, you can loosen the bottom nut, which lowers the lid and then lower the jam nut that lowers the whole lid down even further. So when you go down, it's got probably uh, probably another half inch of adjustment. Wow. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's more than enough to do that. Okay, yeah. you, can see this, you can see the shark cage. <laughs> That is very nice. It's unlikely I'll keep the bag in here. It's just easier to dump the barrel. Mm -hmm. And my eventually, my goal is to, when I move it to its final resting place, is to um, put it up on a platform. And hopefully a 55-gallon drum will fit in here. I'll let you know. Oh, so but they don't have enough up. clearance for that? <clears throat> well, because of the height. No, yeah. but I meant. So, no, but if, if I put it up on the platform, uh, which I think I've got about 24 more inches of height that I can go, which is more than enough to get me into a 55 gallon drum height. Uh, then I'll be switching that over to a 55 gallon drum instead of this. And I'll just literally hoist it on my hand truck and haul it out to my burn pile. So let me ask you this, just by looking at it, where the, collection the eight inch port is and then it tapers down yeah it sounded like it hurt <laughs> so where that tapers down um is what is that connection right there that it's like a black ring it looks like it's got a screw in it no this, down yeah that this is the band that connects the upper barrel to the um tapered barrel and and so um this is the lesson i learned whenever i was unpacking because they had turned this thing, whole thing upside down and they had the motor packed down in here, the impeller packed down in here and a whole bunch of cardboard and some other stuff and all the fittings and hardware. Well, you could get the hardware out, but everything else wouldn't go through this opening. Yeah. Cause I'm an idiot. It took me five minutes to figure out, Oh, take this off. And yeah, you pretty access good. to everything. Well, I'm almost wondering if the height right there is where you could take that off and then put a 55 gallon drum connection of some sort. Well, you, you want this taper. Okay. Um, this is what helps um, helps improve that cyclonic action because mm -hmm. it gives it something to cyclone and, and slowly tapers it down to to the to the uh, final um, reservoir where all the waste is going to go. So you want this this slight tapered action. This is part of the design engineering whatever that goes into that. So I apologize to all Rikon engineers for thinking that was a bad idea. Well, you know, and if you look, all cyclones have this have a similar taper. Even yeah. the super dust deputy that I've got has a similar taper, and that's kind of what helps keep the the vortex moving and flowing 
Oh, you want to do the vortex from Jet for me? <laughs> I don't have enough room. Yeah, no joke. Yeah, it's pretty you, limited in here at this point. If you were unaware back in the day, what was that, 2012 maybe? Uh, there was two guys on a Jet commercial that would put sawdust in their hands and then spin around in a circle to show you literally what a cyclonic action was, and it was their promotional video for that. And we got a kick out of it. I'm going to have to yeah. find that video now. Yeah. Yeah. We would never be allowed to do that at work. No, we would be fired. Yeah. But so uh, this is likely not going to be here when I move it to its final resting place. Um, this may or may not be here there when it gets to its final resting place. Um, but essentially I am going to be using this eight inch hub and um, that's definitely going to be a go-to. But for now I needed to seal this up. And that way, when I put it over there where the other one is, literally it's plug and play. But see, now I have three lines that I can run. So I'll have a designated line ran to my CNC that I'm going to run up and over. And then I'll have one that stays plugged all the time. And then the other uh, goes to my normal system. And you've got, so everything for yours is still mounted to the ceiling, right? Yes. Okay. Because I know originally you had it on the floor. You're using the three pipe system. You just kind of switched out a pipe to whatever you want it to connect to. You now, know, I, I still have that. I still have that manifold in the center uh, because it, it's hard to get underneath the uh, table saw to, and stuff to change that out. So I do have in the middle of my shop, I have one line coming down and then there's three pipes that I've ran out of PVC, one to my table saw, one to my router table, and then the other to a sanding station. And, so whenever I want to switch, instead of having a blast gate, I just literally pull the pipe out, put it in the next pipe, and that's the only pipe active when the dust collection's on. So sort of a redneck blast gate, but I do have a blast gate on that line. I can completely shut it off, but should I need to change between any of those three, that's my current method. Did you do anything on that other than Instagram where you posted vid or a picture of that? Have you done any video on that? I think so. I thought you did, and I couldn't remember for sure. Yeah. That is cool. I'm just excited for you with the uh, upgraded dust collection system. 2100 CFMs. 2125 was my latest reading. Okay. Not 21, to be picky, but. 21, 2125, whatever it takes. If you can tell us what movie that's from, leave a comment below. The true line is 220, 221, whatever it takes. Okay. Yeah. I'll give you hints from the 80s. Yeah, that nears it down. <laughs> Plus, I gave you a decade. But, so here we are. That's it. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty excited about that. Very excited about that. So, that concludes our podcast. No, I'm just kidding. I don't really know what else to talk about since you've got all the glory this week. All Everything's right. looking awesome. What's what you got going on in your shop? I'm gonna turn this light off before it kills everybody with you go blindness. for it. So, uh, well, on my side of things, I am refinishing a bed. No way for Chris because he enjoys this one. So I'm refinishing that bed. Still, I, I took five hours to sand on Sunday, I think it was. So when I put still sanding, it literally was last night or tonight, actually, doing some more of it. But um, just that, that thing's going to take a lot of time. I've got a black bedroom set with uh, rustic distressing on it. And then a, a couple just dropped off their baby furniture. So we have that all to do coming up. You know, for a finisher, you're never finished. Never. There is never an end to it. Not complaining whatsoever. Very blessed to have the work, but at the same time, yep, as a finisher, we're never finished. Clearly. But what else you got kicking other than you're constantly finishing? That's really about it. I mean, uh, we're uh, trying to get some more content stuff loaded up. I had brought you in on that CTE teacher conference. I did mention in the first episode um, that we'll uh, be talking about CNC stuff for that, um, as well as, you know, you're sending 101, 
general basic things that we want the teachers to know when they're talking to students, maybe to kind of add to their curriculum as far as understanding the abrasives. Because when I took shop class, the abrasives were, it's 120 grit and it, you know, is the cheapest the person could find to buy. So we're trying to change that. Mostly the reason I'm trying to change it, because if they spent 10 cents on a sheet instead of two cents, it will last five times longer and they actually save money. But trying to get administration and the teacher to connect to each other is my biggest struggle right now. Yeah, That's when I was in shop, we uh, my shop teacher would go to the local grocery store and he worked out a deal with the little grocery store manager and they would give us used paper bags. That was our sandpaper between goats finish. And you know what? That's an old school trick and it works. Yeah. Um, I think it's compared to 600 or 800 grit it really depends on the scale. Um, but there's nothing wrong with the paper bag trick except for it can't be a waxed paper bag. And anymore, if you get a paper bag, they're going to be waxed. Well, this was the 90s. So. Yeah, they probably it, did. He put his uh, his tall boys in it. That's what he had left over. That's why I gave it to you. <laughs> I can either confirm or deny. By the way, if you are a finisher, more if you're a painter, every painter's tool is a beer opener. It is confirmed. I have spoken with many of painters that will show you that any tool that they have at their disposal for painting technically has a beer opener as one of the tools, like in a five in one. Yeah. Four of them are useful. The one that really counts is the one at the end of the day. I, uh, I, I claim you'll have to prove that point one night. Yeah. I, you know what? I have, an, I have enough of them that I can do that. Because I just won't believe you until until you prove it. There you go. I just don't do glass bottles all that often, so I can do that. The shortage of aluminum. Why not? Let's go glass for a while. I've never had a plastic uh, bottle beer. That is horrible, by the way. <laughs> horrible. Where was that? Uh, National Stadium in D.C. Not a good mm. idea. I can see that. Yep. Well... Uh -huh. I, that's really about all that's going on right now. I mean, I'll do some stuff on there on Instagram. Uh, today I was going to do some, you know, just at least show more sanding, but it was 20 mile an hour winds, probably 40 degrees. And my hands were freezing. Mm -hmm. I was like, I can barely hold the phone. I'm not even going to deal with it. It's it's almost just, May, right? Just leave your man card at the door. I will. That's fine. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. Being on blood thinners, it gets cold quick. Let me tell you, I love the heat now. Now I'm just like, yeah, just bring on the hot days. I'm good. Hmm. Well, that happens, I guess. Yeah. I'm like 80. So, you're, so your life's going pretty good. My life kind of sucks. <laughs> you know, I should have seen that coming. I really should have. I've been trying to figure out a, the best way to bring it in, you know, and I said, well, we're getting drawn, drawn close to the end. I can't let a whole little episode about dust collection go without saying it sucks. So. No joke. So, um, now that you say that, <clears throat> one of the first jobs I had outside of, you know, when I worked for my dad, then I took breaks and I would just go do other jobs. Yeah. So no, I'm, I'm waiting was, to see where you're going with this. Since oh, the trust me. That's fantastic. You'll love it. No. I worked at a vacuum cleaner repair shop and they also sold oh, okay. vacuums. Okay. So you can imagine, you know, how many people would come into the, to the woodworking shop and they would have their woodworking joke, you know, and, and we... Not that they're bad, it's just that we heard them over and over again. So the one that would always catch, you know, was just like, yep, mm -hmm, you know, how's business? Does it suck? What really caught me off guard, though, was an 80-year-old lady that came in and she just, she said that and it just floored me because I'm like, I wasn't expecting her to say that. You know, you get these people that are normal coming in, getting bags, whatever, for their vacuums and they'd say it, okay, yeah. But yeah, that one always threw me for a loop. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes older people say the strangest things. You just they're don't at the age they're, they're at the age where they just don't care. No, like, hey, I, I've been living this long. I can say whatever I want, and you're not going to do a thing about it. Yep. Or they 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 know that you don't expect it, and so that's why they do it is to get that kick out of you. Yep. Yep. Uh, well, I think that's all I've got for this evening, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. Yeah. 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 Hopefully the unveil was was worth it. I wish I could have done a better job, but I, I'm just limited on space now. It's uh, 
you know, you'd be amazed at how much space this takes up, especially right at your main door. So. Yeah, especially with only two omnidirectional wheels and two fixed, it does make a little bit of racket when you're trying to spin it around in a circle. Well, and a bandsaw in the way, another dust collector in the way, a, a freezer in the way. Excuses. Why do you have a freezer in the shop? Uh, we have to have a place for frozen goods and my wife wouldn't let me put it in the spare living room in the house. <laughs> but you still have the refrigerator full of cheer wine, right? Well, it's not full, but it's got some. Yeah. Hashtag okay. cheer wine. There's still cheer wine available yeah. in the fridge and there's still a fridge. Yeah. Well, and the freezer used to be over here in this corner, but I moved it in preparation for this coming and Two, so that when I have to defrost it, it's right here at my garage door. Mm -hmm. So all I got to do is just defrost it and the water goes out and there's no harm, no foul. So it's uh, a lot easier over here. My wife and I were looking at freezers and my favorite feature was the manual defrost feature. Mm. Yeah, this is an old freezer. It's an old stand up. No, that have those features. That's the funny part is the manual defrost is you oh. unplug it and let it melt. And I was like, that's not a feature. Automatic defrost is a feature. Manual defrost shouldn't be listed as one of the features. Sorry, it's a late night. It just it's all right. Yeah, you look tired. Yeah, I was out here last night to about eleven thirty. That's all. Well, that was just out here. Then I went inside and did did computer work. So yeah, I don't know all that designing for CNC. It's kind of crazy. Well, you got to stay ahead of the game. That's true. So I got a cool new uh, project coming up that uh, I'm working on a prototype. So we'll talk about that another time. Ooh, so, I don't even know about it. Even better. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Oh, never mind. I do. Yeah, it's that uh, dispenser oh, thing. Oh, the dispenser prototype. Nice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You've got to get that completed. Yeah, I have a um, guy at works turning me some dowels down that because I made the holes too big. My fault. Don't. Don't they sell dowels there? Yes, but I need them sort of customized. One inch. <laughs> I gotta know. It needs to be one inch diameter by a quarter inch width, and then the rest of the two inch dowel needs to be seven eighths diameter. Gotcha. Okay. So it basically, so. needs to be a, has to have a, a turned shoulder on it because I I screwed up. So, but it's be expected with a prototype. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just don't screw up that dust collector prototype. Yeah, that would suck. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll talk about that another day. Once I get right. one built, it looks good and functions. And it's not too long? Mm, sure. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you to everybody for watching. And uh, don't forget to check it out. Um trying to think what it's called now hold on a second here hold on i got this what are we checking out we're checking out buzzsprout whatnot podcast ah. is where we host the audio versions of these and when we get enough of them we can put it on spotify but as of right now we just got to do the uh the general hosting area but if you'd like just the audio to listen to of this at a later date possibly i'll have to stream it on youtube with the video we have that available yeah i was about to say you know i do that at work a lot i actually do the youtube and then I just do my other stuff while the YouTube part is playing and I'm just listening to the audio. So, yes, um, that works you know out what? really well. Let me ask you that. What are you, is it music? What are you listening to in the background? Cause I do the exact same thing. Different podcasts, different, uh, different videos. Um, sometimes you get, you know, woodworking reviews. You don't need to see the product. You need to hear what they're talking about. So you can listen to the review. Um, you know, sometimes it's a uh, you know, radio station. I've got a local radio station that I like. Well, they have a, a podcast that they do for an hour after the show. That's stuff they really couldn't air on the show. And so I'm going back earlier years and just listening. To some it, out. it just depends. You know? So now, I have to focus on really, really focus. Sometimes I do that just to drown out all the surrounding noise. So, You've got a lot of it there too. And I'm not naming names, but there's some surrounding <laughs> noise and surrounding music. And um, this just enables me to kind of drown that out and focus on my thing. So, so as a quick side note, uh, in December, I had health issues. So I had to start working from home. Chris got the pleasure of taking my old desk. 
in which he found out very quickly that that is a catch-all for every noise in the cube farm from yes. personal radios that aren't that loud at their desk but trust me they're loud in that cube and it's that twangy country all day long oh it's the 90s twangy too yeah buddy <laughs> I know songs. Not to offend anyone who likes that '90s twangy country. This is just not my preference all day long. But I know way too many songs now by Tanya Tucker. Mm -hmm. I don't even know who Tanya Tucker is, but I know the songs. (laughs) So yeah, that's that's uh, that's life. That's the way we are now. So man, listen to the podcast. You don't have to go to the go to the Buzz Sprout. You can go to the YouTube. You can go to Facebook. Just listen to the audio if you want. But you know. You wouldn't see this if you just listened to audio. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? So uh, in the background from myself, I've been doing live on patrol, which is, I know it sounds crazy. It's two guys from Minnesota. Both Minnesota. of them have been Minnesota. So they're from St. Paul, not from uh, Milwaukee where all the action's happening. But they both live there their entire lives. One's Bob Ramsey. He's the current sheriff. No, not Bob Ramsey. Sorry, can't even think of Bob's last name. But Ramsey County is the is the county, and he's the sheriff, and he's got Pat with him every Friday night at eleven nine eleven p.m. They go live. Whatever happens, happens. So it's kind of like you know whatever those shows are that have had the live PD or something, but instead they have to mute it. They have to keep policy of certain things. But what I really like is just they talk about the history of St. Paul. And I've learned so much about St. Paul, just listening to them in the background. I don't even, cause it's just them driving. So really the video, there's a couple of cool parts, high speed chases, blah, blah. But just listening to them talk is just two guys sitting in a car is, is, I don't know. It's kind of nice when you're trying to program things for the website. Hmm. doesn't take much brain power, but at the same time, I've learned a lot about St. Paul. Oh, there you go. So that's, you know, Hey, why not? That's my YouTube channel throw out there. Cause I just, it's good for me. It works. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Whatever it takes to get you through the day. No kidding. Yeah. Without using any of my paint supplies. Yeah. So, John, thank you very much for watching. Kyle, thank you so much for watching. You guys have commented. I don't know if you saw this one, Chris, but um, thank you guys for supporting, watching, hanging out with us tonight. Yeah, we appreciate it. I know sometimes... Mm -hmm. We never know what's going to happen. So it's, uh, you know, sometimes it works out well if we can fill the space and, and put out good content. So if there are things you feel like we need to do better, let us know. I mean, hey, we're, oh, we're, yeah. humble, we're humble guys, man. We we, we, we respect the uh, honest feedback. So, yep. um, you know, we'll just want to present that's why it's called Whatnot because we were like, what do we do? And we'll, we'll talk about woodworking and whatnot. Yeah, we talk about this, we talk about that, we talk about whatnot, you know, whatever. Hey. You know. I mean, literally, this is kind of the conversations we have if we were on video chat anyway. So it's like, why not just record it? Sometimes yeah. it's actually good stuff. Sometimes it's probably decent. What were you thinking? I don't know. Let me just go ahead and hit that in broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> we do appreciate it. We'll see you next time. All right. I'm Mike Z. I'm Chris. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a good night. <laughs>